Hi all, Dr. Clark here, and for forest management, this time we're going to talk about forest diseases. All right. And I have to kind of preface this topic with some, I guess you could say some important information along the disease spectrum. Okay, Diseases when it comes to plant diseases are normally carried by insects. Uh, so you can have like white flies or you know some type of moth or beetle. Something is carrying that disease to the tree. And sometimes the disease is the result of the insect itself that is consuming the material. Sometimes the disease is a bacteria or fungi that is carried with the invertebrate to the plant. Okay? So <clears throat> often we see diseases when it comes to forest management or forest, um, you know, the insects or the invertebrates, they're getting the blame, they're getting kind of, you know, the, the underlying cause is the invertebrates. Um, this is absolutely true. However, without the invertebrates, without these insects, you would not have a forest. You would not have pollination. You would not have seed regeneration. You wouldn't, I mean, none of it. You would have no nutrient uh, cycling, nothing. So when we think about balancing management, forest management, we also have to think about, you know, if you spray pesticides across your entire landscape, Yes, you'll kill the harmful insects, but there's very few pesticides that also allow for the beneficial insects to live. We figured this out the hard way. Okay? A lot of the populations of pollinators, bees and butterflies and moths that we rely very heavily on, their populations are in decline and have been for a very long time. Part of that has to do with the overuse of pesticides, but another part of that has to do with removal of vegetation that they need in order to reproduce. Okay? And, you know, a great example of this is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly reproduces only on a single species. Okay, it, it reproduces on milkweed. That's where its caterpillars, that's where its eggs are laid and its caterpillars grow is on milkweed. That's where the caterpillar and the butterfly gets its toxin. Okay, if you didn't know, monarch butterflies are actually poisonous or toxic. <clears throat> and um, that toxin is sequestered from the milkweed. Well, a long time ago, um, you know, probably in the early 1900s, maybe even before that, Ranchers decided that milkweed was not palatable for cattle and um, other sheep and un other things that are going to be grazing the land, mainly cattle. So they would remove all the milkweed. Okay? And so by removing all the milkweed, you now cause this monarch butterfly populations to decline. By an extreme amount. Yeah. And so this is it's just a case of us managing something, managing vegetation, but not knowing the consequences of managing that vegetation. So today I'm going to talk about forest diseases, but I don't want you to think that the answer to forest disease is spray it with a pesticide. The answer to many diseases is allow them to take their place because they're going to make the forest healthier. It's going to cause what we call an evolutionary arms race. There's a battle between the plant and that disease and the plants that are best suited for that type of disease or that variant of the disease are the ones that are going to reproduce and, you know, progress into the future. We can cheat the system, and we've done a lot to do this, 
and we can genetically modify the or organisms so they can fight off diseases so we don't have to use pesticides and so you're just changing the genes so you make evolution a little bit faster okay so we're going to go into some diseases but i you know i have to give the caveat there that i do not think just because insects are the root of all diseases that you should have no insects in the forest habitat that's for surely not my opinion and um I don't want that to come across in the lecture. Okay, so there are quite a few types of diseases and, and they can be broken up into really two different types of categories. First of all, you can, if you're knowledgeable about diseases, then you would, you'd break them up as the cause of the disease. So what's actually causing the disease? Okay, and that would be the category at which you put. Um, so is it caused by insects? Is it caused by bacteria, fungi, viruses? Is it caused by a combination? So the insect carries the bacteria or the fungi or the virus. Um, is it an abiotic disease, meaning non-living disease? So is this caused by nutrient deficiency, um, extreme temperatures, uh, lack of moisture? So there, there are quite a few different causes of disease, diseases. Some managers will break it up um, into the cause of the disease, and that's how they categorize it. So this is, you know, a disease that's caused by a burrowing insect or a burrowing beetle. Okay, and and so that's how they deviate it. Other managers will break off diseases in well, what's affected. Okay, so what's being affected with the disease and and that's kind of where i'm going to lay out this lecture is what's the location of the disease what's where's the disease occurring um and how does that affect and and then overall what is that going to do to the tree itself okay is it detrimental is the tree going to die is it going to spread is it going to kill off a lot of your forest or is it just going to you know, make the tree look a little bit different, um, but really doesn't do much to the tree in general. Okay, so the lo locations of the diseases, there's four main ones that I, I like to talk about. That's foliage and leaf. So these are the photos, typically the photosynthetic parts of the vegetation, okay, apart from, you know, desert plants, which do photosynthesis um, on the stems and and trunks of, of those vegetation. But for the most part, when we talk about trees, the photosynthetic material is going to be in the foliage, the, late, the leaves, okay? Uh, branches and stems, this is going to be the material that is used in most of our production purposes. So outside of fruiting bodies, which we're not really going to talk about Disease-wise, there are diseases that attack the fruiting bodies, but we're talking more about the diseases that are attacking the the branch, the stem, or what some people would call the, the trunk of the tree, the main stem of the tree. That main stem of the tree is obviously, from a forest perspective, that's what we're most interested in. That's where we're going to get our board foot. That's where we're going to get our volume a cubic volume of usable material. So diseases that affect that are highly um, sought after and, and we need more information and, and need protection from those diseases. Root diseases, um, okay, they're, we'll get to this, but they're very difficult um, because you can't really see them. And then vascular diseases, this can affect really all three uh, other locations. So the vascular diseases would be the diseases that are affecting the xylem and the phloem that is carrying nutrients and water throughout the tree's tissue. So it could affect the leaves and does and, and the stem and the branches and even the roots because that's where a lot of the nutrients are coming from um, and that's how they're getting absorbed. So a disease that's in the vascular system can be detrimental to the, the plant also. So we're going to cover those four types or locations of diseases, and I'll talk a little bit more about each one. Okay, when we're looking at foliage and leaf diseases, 
first of all, the main component to this is they're super easy to spot. And most of you probably have seen diseases on forest foliage, um, whether that be like brown spot or black spot that occur on a lot of, you know, deciduous trees, things that drop their leaves. You can see the spotting pattern um, often, you know, th these are just easy to easy to pick out. OK, now the reason for the disease might be a little bit more difficult. It could be insect. It could be viral, bacterial, um, fungi. There's a lot of reasons. Nutrition, abiotic diseases can show up in, in um, spotting of the leaves or yellowing of the leaves, or oranging of the, of the leaves will occur due to nutrition de deficiencies, etc. Okay, um, but over overall, the important part when it comes to foliage and leaf diseases is most of the time it's harmless. Most of the time, the disease is not severe enough that it's affecting the photosynthetic ability of that plant. Now, if the purpose of the foliage is for you to utilize the foliage in some way, okay, um, you're selling the foliage, you know, as a as a beautiful, you know, ornamental or so, uh, something along those lines, or or the foliage of that certain tree is consumed. Okay, then then it might be might be a little bit different. But for the most part, when we're talking about forests we're not talking about consuming the foliage we're not talking about even utilizing the foliage um, we're talking about that foliage is used for photosynthesis photosynthesis of that organism they do have the ability to spread from leaf to leaf especially if they're you know bacterial or viral um, in nature that that can often just shift and, and spread from leaf to leaf including nearby trees um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about some of the stem diseases uh, but high density forests have a problem with high density um, diseases okay and you can think of this a lot like humans okay um, if you look at you know, diseases, viral infections, things like that. The majority of diseases and, and infections come from areas where people are close in proximity to each other because diseases can hop between each other um, very quickly. So all it takes is one individual to have a suppressed immune system and they can develop a disease and then that can switch to another individual and another individual. And often when you have overcrowding in a forest, not only do they have suppressed immune systems, the reason why there's suppressed immune systems is there's a problem with nutrient, nutrient deficiency or water uptake or sunlight deficiency. <clears throat> so there's another underlying cause to the spread of that disease okay and we'll, we'll look at some of these examples okay signs of diseases um you know spotting in leaves which is often called lesions okay so it cannot it can be more than just a spot it can be you know a whole uh browning of the edge of the leaf um uh, or uh you know along the veins of the leaf you can have a lot of discoloration that you know or gouges and things like that um, those are lesions discoloration of the entire foliage okay this is often a nutrient deficiency um, but can can be the result of a bacterial infection viral infection um, but the whole leaf material would be would be you know a different color okay and that might might, might even be the case of the entire tree um, that that happens when you know nutrients or the soils are too acidic um things like that you can have an entire tree all the foliage um, changes its color and and you know has that discoloration 
And then one of the key signs is defoliation or early defoliation. Um, so the dropping of leaves before, you know, the fall drop, uh, the dropping of needles. So a large amount of needles being shed off the tree. Um, these are signs of a disease or uh, of some type. Yeah. Now there are some controls if you can distinguish that it's a fungal infection. You can use fungicides. Um, they have been used. Uh, if you know that it's an insect, so maybe it's a gall, um, so a, a burrowing insect, so maybe these lesions on the leaf are actually bumps that contain um, a fly larvae in them or a wasp larvae in them. These are called galls. This is possible to use an insecticide to remove um, that presence. You have moths that will um, lay their larvae inside tissue also. They hatch, they eat the foliage, um, which can cause, you know, that a foliage or leaf disease. But by and large, probably the best method to control foliage and leaf diseases is to remove it. Um, so if it's just one branch and, you know, you, you're an apple orchard or, or, you know, a citrus orchard, okay, that type of forest, if it's just one branch, remove the branch. Okay? Um, if it's in a plantation, Hey, uh, you, you might remove the entire tree. If it's if you're a forest manager and you see just one tree that you know that is within your management area, you see one tree that seems to be affected. Again, removal of a single tree is is fine, or a, a few trees. So maybe you go through and you mark some trees. Um, but by and large, when it comes to foliage and leaf diseases, most people, most managers, you just don't do anything about it. Um, if it's a nutrient deficiency, then you might add nutrients. But if it's due to, you know, bacteria, fungi, viruses, insects, then you just you just leave it and um, let it take its course. And eventually, um, either those trees that are affected will die on their own, or um, they'll get better and life will be better the next year. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's jump whoops, to branch and stem diseases. Okay, like I said before, uh, these are the big ones. These are affecting your board foot. This is affecting your cubic volume. And they can be hidden diseases. So they can be internal, and you might not even know it until you've cut the tree down. Um, okay, some are easily spotted some spot you know like these galls or abnormalities okay those are easy these big cankers are, are easy to to point out these fungi bodies um okay these are pretty easy to point out but some are internal and some you you can't tell until you've cut the tree and then you realize that the tree has center rot um and the you know the stem of the tree is all rotted out uh, and thus you have no board foot okay so they can have a significant impact especially if you're managing for um, forest for the board foot or the cubic volume um, point of view it can destroy old trees and often does destroy older trees Okay, so the large older trees, the ones that are near that harvest size or that harvest age, these are the ones that often get infected with branch and stem diseases because as they're increasing in age, very much like a human, their cells have been decreasing, their maintenance cost to maintain those cells and the and whatnot is increasing and so over time what happens is your immune system costs a lot more the tree's immune system costs a lot more energetically and you got this give and take uh, and and the tree um basically has a reduced immune system 
so you can get these establishments of these different types of diseases and the tree um, can get infected thus hurting your bottom dollar um, for a long-term investment so how do you remove it um, tree removal that's the the most often method if you see you know large amounts of fruit fungi fruiting bodies you know that this is not just occurring on the outside of the tree okay these fungi are consuming nutrients from within the tree okay so fungi aren't photosynthetic so they're consuming the tree material they're decomposers so their rooting bodies are, are in here consuming tree nutrients and tree material thus you know this tree is infected and you should just remove the tree if you remove it at an early size early or early stature the tree might not be affected totally and you still could get some board foot or cubic volume from it cankers and things like that these are really easy to see um and you can understand the um, amount of material that's been removed galls and, and abnormal growth sometimes that's subsurface but a lot of times it will enter into the <clears throat> the uh, actual hardwood of of the tree and cause deterioration so tree removal most of the time you're going to remove the tree and uh, not be able to utilize the material from the tree there are some methods to preventing the the uh, fungal growth or even the bacterial infections that might cause some of these you can inject your tree with anti-fungi a fungicide um, injection and so you literally like you would inject a human um, with you know material to uh, fight off a bacterial infection or a fungi infection uh, you do the same thing you enter into um, the xylem and and you inject a fungicide into the tree okay and then it's you know populating the uh, vascular tissue of the tree and it fights off the fungal infection i would argue that this injection method is probably only relevant when you're talking about very um expensive high order tree material um, but when you're talking about large plantations um, where you're growing the same tree maybe even genetically speaking they're almost identical to each other the best method is just to cut it remove it burn it um, get it off the property and you know replant that region or whatnot but injections maybe for something like a black oak um or something that you know has to reach a certain size before it's uh worthy of cutting and you get early diseases maybe it's maybe it's worth injecting a fungicide into the trees okay so root diseases like I said before, root diseases are difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. If it's a fungal infection or something like that, there is that possibility of injecting um, fun fungicide into the root, root zone, whatnot. But overall, it's hard to tell whether or not that tree is infected until the signs of infection um are normally severe enough that the tree is declined to the point of no return so you know like i said before you if you're managing a forest okay and you go through and you see a bunch of mushrooms at the base of a tree that doesn't necessarily mean that those fruiting bodies of that fungi are affecting the tree's roots it could be that it's decomposing the leaf litter or decomposing an organism that occurred in that region. L trees um, often will have a very good symbiosis with fungi. And so that fungi might be turning over lots of nutrients right there in that region. The roots can suck it up, et cetera. And it's not affecting the tree at all. So just because there's fungi next to the tree, 
It doesn't mean that you have a fungi problem in the rooting zone. Okay. So the outside appearance of the tree, it's difficult to know what's going on until the signs are severe, like decline in tree health. So you get um, it looks like, you know, you're getting nutrient deficiency. So the, the leaves are all, you know, yellowing or oranging out. Um, the needles are dropping. A, uh, you might have branches that are not forming correctly. Um, you might have a tree leaning. Okay. Um, these kind of, these different things are definitely signs that the tree itself is affect, been infected with a rooting disease. But often by the time you see the sign, by the time you see that the tree is leaning because the roots are, are you know, decomposing on one region, it's too late. Okay? The tree has to be removed. Um, so you know, a fungicide or something like that might work in some circumstances, but for the most part, the tree has to be removed um, and and either, you know, used as as board foot if it's not infected into the, the stem of the tree. Um, otherwise, it needs to be burnt um, and, and removed completely. Uh, so one way to often... I guess you could say combat rooting diseases is by positive forest management. Okay, we'll often see rooting diseases in regions where the the forest have not been managed properly. Okay, we'll see it in regions where the density of the forest is too heavy. Okay, so you got massive competition, very little nutrients, competition for water, sunlight, etc. Okay, and you'll you'll start getting rooting disease occur in those regions, and you'll get wind blown trees. So the trees will all be leaning, or wind thrown trees. They'll all be leaning in in one direction, um, and you know that's that's often a problem because the forest itself hasn't been managed correctly. Um, management would be knowing basically how much space the trees need between them, using fire wisely to manage the competition of understory plants, okay? um, these kind of things. Fire also will remove those bacterial and fungi buildup in, in regions within a forest. So proper forest management okay, will often prevent rooting diseases. Okay. But again, like I said before, these are very difficult to diagnose and even probably harder to treat. You pretty much, if you have it, the tree has to be removed. Vascular diseases. These are also, along with kind of stem diseases, these are um, very expensive uh, I, I should say these can hurt the bottom dollar of of a forest. Okay, so if you're, you know, if you have a tree plot and the purpose of the tree plot is to make money off of it, so you're going to cut it and harvest it. Um, a vascular disease is um, is a big deal um, and a detrimental effect to the tree. Most of the time, what's going on is Either the xylem or phloem or both is being blocked or has, has been damaged. So either you're getting nutrient deficiency or you're getting moisture deficiency. Okay. So one of the others. Um, and, and I guess in some cases you're getting both and, and then the tree is, is, is gone. But Either the xylem, which is carrying the nutrients, or the phloem, which is carrying the water, um, either either one of those is is being affected often by these vascular diseases. Again, the vascular disease is often carried by a boring 
um, invertebrate, but sometimes fungi that can establish themselves on the outside of a, a tree and go through the uh, bark of the tree and into the vascular system can affect it. Okay, so not always is it insect driven, but a, a lot of times it's insect driven. Here you can see a picture of a pine park pine bark beetle. Okay, and they carry with them a fungus that leaves this kind of blue staining in the tree. Okay, so the beetle itself not really detrimental to the tree. The beetle will bore in, okay, lay its larvae in there, but with that beetle often carry comes a fungi. That fungi then can spread through the vascular system, clogging all the, the phloem and basically dehydrating the tree, causes the tree to die. And, uh, and, and, and the rest is history. Now, Again, you can have vascular disease problems that is catastrophic. Um, in other words, it can be very severe throughout the entire forest. Um, you, we've seen this with pine, pine bark beetle um, outbreaks in Colorado and Wyoming and Utah and Montana, Idaho, um, huge loss, even parts of northern Arizona, huge loss to pine bark beetles. Um, recently, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, those losses have been catastrophic. Oh, huge swaths of forest lost to pine bark beetles. Okay. Now, it's a combination. Um, it's not just the pine bark beetle. The pine bark beetle has evolved with pines for, you know, millions of years. So it's not that this new beetle from outside of the United States was introduced. It's a native beetle. The pine bark beetle is a native beetle. Okay, But what's also going on in these regions is massive drought. So you got massive drought in the regions of the Rocky Mountains. And so the tree's ability to make pitch and the ability to fight off infections is now decreased its immune system is down and the beetles okay have you know still bring in the infection okay but the trees aren't able to fight it off along with that we've seemingly had less severe winters so you have less die off in the beetles okay so the beetles aren't dying as much the populations of the beetles are higher Okay, so you had these catastrophic losses. Okay, like every single tree in the forest gone. Okay, now there are signs for this, and and you can see these signs, and and you can see burrowing marks often. Okay, uh, and that's where you know an organism has entered. Uh, you can see something like this, which is a pitch tube. Okay, so the insect burrowed in, and then the tree. Um, pitched out okay so this is the natural defense of the tree is to you know produce a lot of resin or pitch and that will encapsulate the beetle push the beetle back out the beetle will die and the larvae if there was larvae that was laid um, the larvae would be encapsulated and die also that's the natural defense of the tree but if you don't have enough water you don't have enough nutrients um, or you have too many beetles infecting you at the same time, uh, you can't pitch out every beetle and then you get infected and die. Um, so other means by which you can see the signs, you can see wilting leaves, you can see the crowns of the trees dying off first. Okay, And this is often a key sign is if you see the tops of the trees uh, dying off, that means that something's cutting off the energy source from the roots to the crown of the tree. Okay? And, and you know that the xylem or the phloem has been blocked, early leaf drop, etc. And really, the only method to control this is removal. Um, the problem is, is when your entire forest is infected, you'd have to remove the entire forest. Um, 
And for forest managers, that's very difficult and, and probably not going to occur. For more controlled stands, um, personal owners and things like that, if you see you know, heavy insect uh, growing marks, then that tree should be removed and removed from the property. Um, that's probably the best method. Okay. Vascular diseases along with, you know, stem diseases can have catastrophic losses and they can be tied to each other clearly because they're occurring on the stem, okay, the main trunk of the, the tree. And that's the region where, you know, you're trying to get your board foot, et cetera. From. So again, forest decline. Hey, you can see um, in this picture, you can see a massive amount of dead trees throughout this, you know, Rocky Mountain region. This is this is due to uh, pine bark beetle. But you can see some trees that are not affected. Okay, and the trees that are not affected, some in some cases, is different species than the other trees. But in other cases, these are trees that are either younger or um, have been able to fight off the infection. These trees are, are better suited for the current environment. Okay? So you can see that they might make it, they might withstand that infection. Now with the open spaces, they'll have the ability to grow, reproduce more seeds, and the forest will come back um, fairly quickly. Uh, most forest declines though are not going to be contributed to a single source of infection, a single disease. Most are combination diseases. Okay, so when you're looking at a drastic loss, when you're looking at 60, 70, 80 percent of your trees in a forest gone, it's due to a combination of factors. It could be due to, you know, the age of the forest, all the trees, they're all planted at the same time, they're all single age, they're all getting up there in ages, so all their immune systems are comparable to diseases and and uh you know you combine that with the drought combine that with poor soil because they've been planted too close to each other so all the nutrients are being leached out okay and then you can get some drastic diseases um come through where you might get one of those burrowing insects affecting your forest okay so again declines occur when often you have a mixture of age drought poor soil temperature insects root damage something um, you get a mixture of these or a combination of these working together, you can have drastic effects. Abiotic diseases, um, sometimes these are called disorders. Uh, it, it just depends on what it's from. Again, these are non-species specific. So where you might look at the effects of pine bark beetles on, on a Rocky Mountain forest, you know, pine bark beetles are mainly seeking out pine trees, ponderosa, limber, um, lodgepole. These different pine trees are going to be affected by the pine bark beetle. As far as other trees, you know, that might be in the region, aspen, um, you know, spruces, these other trees that might be in the region, they might not, not be affected at all. And that's because that insect is not carrying that, that disease and they don't burrow into those trees and they're, they're not affecting those trees. Abiotic diseases though, are not species specific. They'll affect everything on the landscape. Okay, so um, they're, again, abiotic or A meaning non-biotic living, so non-living agents they can be fire, nutrient deficiency, lightning, flood, lots of different things. Chemicals, so chemicals meaning like runoff in the water, but also chemicals from acid rain. That's what this picture here is. This is a forest that has been infected with acid rain. And it doesn't matter what types of trees these are, it's hard to tell now, um, but all the organisms are gonna be infected with that, okay? Um, so in some cases, even though it's not species specific, we call them non-living diseases, they could be caused by human action. Okay, so flooding, 
chemical deposits, even nutrient deficient, fire, uh, these inju injuries from, you know, just people doing stupid things um, like, you know, kids chopping on trees with axes in, you know, in a campground. OK, um, these injuries are abiotic diseases. OK, but they can be human induced. So I don't want you to think if it's an abiotic diseases, you know, a fire broke out and it burnt the entire forest. I don't want you to think, well, that fire is an abiotic disease and has no connection back to a biotic organism. Often it has a connection right back to humans. Okay? Um, that's not to say that lightning isn't causing a lot of fires. It is, but humans cause a massive amount of fires due to, uh, you know, non-wise decisions. <clears throat> so abiotic diseases can have that direct connection back with a biotic organism, but abiotics, again, are the one key component is they're not species specific. So they're not going to just select a single species. They're going to select the entire forest. Okay. All right. So with that being said, that's kind of just a overview of diseases. Again, if you're interested in a certain type of disease or if you're a manager and you're interested in a single disease like Dutch elm disease or something like that, um, you would need to, there's obviously literature on these, but you would need to know the signs for the given species. So besides abiotic diseases, almost all the other diseases are biotic diseases. And for the most part, they're species specific or at least genera specific diseases. So if we're talking pine bark beetles, you have to know, well, what types of pine do pine bark beetles affect? What's the sign of a pine bark beetle, et cetera? Okay? If, you, if you are interested in other diseases, if you're interested in cankers that occur, if you're interested in like fire spot or fire blight, um, okay, these are often bacterial or fungi diseases, okay, but you have to know what tree is going to be directly infected by that, or what group of trees infected by that, what's the sign for each different uh, species of tree. So again, this is just an overview, kind of giving you kind of how a manager might break off the different types of diseases, but then within each one of those, you have to know, okay, what are the foliage diseases for ponderosa pine? What are the stem diseases for ponderosa pine? The rooting diseases for ponderosa pine? If that's the tree type, the species that you're a manager of. Okay, until next time.